So today um, I'm going to be presenting imposter syndrome's bigger, badder sibling, shame. Um, some of you don't know who I am, um, but uh, I've been a web developer since 1993. I've been a Drupal developer since 2004, a core dev developer since 2006. I've been in maintainers.txt since 2010, and I probably will never leave there because I'm the maintainer of the Stark theme. <laughs> um, and I've done like 70, over 70 presentations and keynotes in four different continents. Um, and then since 2009, uh, I've lived in Taiwan. I still live in Taiwan. Um, and in fact, uh, my story with imposter syndrome starts here. This is a picture of DrupalCon DC from 2009. Um, was anybody at this conference? No, okay. Um, I know almost everybody in this part of the, the <laughs> shot. Um, and you can see me, I am here, in between Greg Dunlap and David Wong. Um, and uh, this is my first DrupalCon. Um, and um, it was also David Huang's first DrupalCon. Um, and we both became much more involved in DrupalCons from this point on. Um, and in 2015, uh, David was uh, helping to organize DrupalCon Los Angeles. Um, and he was putting together a panel about imposter syndrome. Right? What is imposter syndrome? It's actually really easy to describe it. It's being qualified and then believing you're not. Um, this is terrible. Um, I, I can't imagine this feeling. Like, it's just... This is an important talk. This is an important... Sorry. This is an important topic. Um, and I want to go over a couple quick myths about imposter syndrome, people get a wrong idea about it. Um, they think that it's a permanent personality trait. It is not. It is something that uh, is affecting your, your mind and your actions, but it's not permanent. You can heal from this. Um, some people think that it increases your motivation and success. The success and, and motivation that you do is despite your imposter syndrome. All of that stuff that you're accomplishing is not because of imposter syndrome. You are doing it because of your abilities. And there's also a misconception that it only affects the oppressed and the marginalized. And while it's true that marginalized people and oppressed people definitely have disproportionately more imposter syndrome people in it, um, it's, not it's not required that you are oppressed or marginalized. Even a white male can have imposter syndrome. Um, but because it affects the oppressed and marginalized disproportionately, I felt like this was a really important topic, and I was glad that David Wong brought this up in 2015 and said we need to talk about this because it's important that we have all kinds of people, all kinds of ideas together in the Drupal community and not addressing this meant that we would limit the people who would be able to contribute. Um, and it was really, really important. And I was uh, really grateful that he decided to talk about this. Um, and if you look since 2015, we've consistently had talks at DrupalCons about imposter syndrome. And uh, David wanted me to be on this panel in 2015 with other people who have imposter syndrome uh, because people who are very well known in the Drupal community have imposter syndrome, imposter syndrome. And I said, David, thank you for inviting me. There's just one problem. I don't have imposter syndrome. <laughs> um, if I had joined it, I would have been an actual imposter <laughs> among the people who have imposter syndrome. <laughs> Um, you wouldn't want to come to a talk about imposter syndrome that was given by somebody who doesn't have imposter syndrome. <laughs> um, 
unfortunately, this talk is about shame. And spoiler alert, uh, I'm qualified to talk about that topic. <laughs> Um, what is the root of imposter syndrome? What's, what's causing that? Well, it's, it's shame. And I know what you're thinking. The first thing that pops in my head when I think of shame is <laughs> this scene from Game of Thrones. Um, this is a really uh, heavy subject. Um, and the only way that I'm able to get through it is by putting funny pictures of myself on screen. I think people don't quite understand what shame is. That, never mind. Um, they don't quite understand it. They, when people talk about shame, they use it sort of interchangeably with guilt, but these are not the same things. Shame is not guilt. Guilt is I did something bad, and shame is I am bad. That is completely different. When you are feeling guilty is because you have a sort of internal set of morals and you've done something that did not meet your, your morals, right? And you feel guilty about that. And that makes handling guilt straightforward. Not, not easy, but straightforward. You have to figure out a way to correct the mistake, the injustice, whatever action that you've done in order to make up for your guilt. But shame is complex. It is really complex. There are different ways that we can acquire shame. There are different ways that we process shame internally. How do we think about it in our minds? There are different ways that it manifests, it's different symptoms of shame that <laughs> become our actions because we have shame. And then, of course, how we heal from it. All of these things are different facets of shame. And imposter syndrome is just one of the possible sort of symptoms of shame. But our personal experience with shame, and a single individual's experience with shame might look more like this. You can have multiple different ways that you've acquired the shame and how you process it, different ways of manifesting, different symptoms, and then of course how you heal is going to depend on all those other factors. Our individual experience with shame is very unique. And that's part of what makes shame complex. I wanted to talk about how shame manifests first before I talk about you know, where we get it. Sorry, before we talk about, yeah. Shame is complex. I wanted to talk about how it manifests so we understand where, where we're going. Like, I still feel like it's a little hard to understand. If I start talking about how we acquire it and how we process it, people are like, I don't know where we're going. I don't know. I, under I don't understand imposter syndrome. So let's talk about how it manifests all these different symptoms first, and then we'll go back to the top and acquire and process and heal. Okay. So. Yeah. These are all the different ways that shame can present themselves in a work context. There are a lot of other ways outside of work that shame could also uh, manifest. We're not going to talk about them just because I'm trying to limit the scope. Imposter syndrome, which I've already mentioned. Avoidance. When you are ashamed of something, you try to avoid those situations. That can be a dynamic that happens inside your workplace. Um, a more extreme version of that is then isolation, where that person who has shame will like run away from the sort of work environment. Poor communication. This one is about not understanding your own needs. If you have shame, you may have difficulty expressing your needs. You don't feel like it's valid for you to have them. 
and that can lead to poor communication. And then absenteeism, you can, you can get physically sick and miss days, or you can be mentally unwell and not want to participate, and absenteeism is one thing. Resentment, this is again about like not understanding our own needs, and when we don't express our needs, other people can get recognition or opportunities that we haven't verbalized that we also want to be considered for these opportunities, and then we have resentment. Disengagement, all of this stuff starts overwhelming you. You just sort of like, I'm going to do the bare minimum. This is another way that shame can manifest. Procrastination. <laughs> uh, procrastination can be caused by a bunch of different things. Shame is just one of them. The shame can cause procrastination. And perfectionism. When we feel like we are bad, sometimes we just set our standards so incredibly high before we want to show people our work. It has to be perfect because otherwise you'll see our shame. You see something that we feel is shameful. And then narcissism. This one's a little bit surprising to me, but like when you have a internal shame where you don't feel like you're worthy, some people will project a, a, uh, a facade that is bigger and you know, more perfect than their actual self. And that comes out as narcissism. narcissism. So now we talked about all these different ways that shame could present in the workplace. Let's, let's go back and talk about how shame happens in the first place. Shame is a relational wound. Um, it is a wound that happens in our relations with another person. Um, typically, this can happen like when we're year, really young with a caretaker. Um, for example, let's pick a toddler. Um, if they've like petting the cat the wrong way, like tail to head, for example, because <laughs> they just don't know any better, the parent can be like, hey, you're petting the cat wrong, you're hurting him, right? And the child will feel a lot of shame about being bad. When you're that young, you don't understand the difference between your actions and who you are. Everything that you do, that is who you are, and that will lead to a direct shaming, I'm bad because I pet the cat wrong. Now, in those cases, it's really easy to repair the shame. The caretaker just has to say, you didn't know any better. It's okay to feel this way. Now that you know, you can correct it by petting the cat the right way. But shame is because of the absence of connection. This is the fundamental thing about shame. It is that disconnect from somebody that we care a lot about a relationship that we have with another person. That is, that is what is really fundamental to understanding and healing from shame. Uh, how do we start to internalize the shame? How do, we, like, how do we get this shame, right? Where does it come from? Direct shame. Um, somebody is saying that you are bad, um, there are some parents who are not great parents and they will yell at their kid and tell them how worthless they are. That is an example of direct shame. Then there is indirect shame. You may see uh, somebody expressing direct shame at a different person and you then become fearful that that could happen to you and now you have this shame about um, I'm worried that that might happen to me. I better not do that thing that causes direct shame. And now you've got this shame just from experiencing somebody else's direct shame. Then we have neglectful shame. When somebody that we care about neglects us, doesn't give us what we need, we start to feel like maybe that's because we're not worthy of that care of that love, of that support that we are not getting. 
So this becomes shame about being neglected. And then the last one is grandiose shame. Um, hiding shame through grandiosity, right? This is the narcissism again. So these are the different ways that we can acquire shame. And then the next are four types of shame of how we actually process it internally. This is the most... <clears throat> I got this out of a book by Ken Banal, um, or a paper by him. Uh, these are psychologists talking amongst peers about other psychologists about shame. Um, this is the most technical slide. Um, I hope I'm expressing it properly, but shame, how we process it internally is kind of a, a spectrum here um, with understanding and, and recognizing our shame on the left and then off to the right is traumatic states where we we lose the ability to understand that we even have shame so i'm going to go through these different four types first is good enough me this is where we have shame so we feel bad about parts of ourselves, but we still have other parts that we recognize are good and therefore, we were able to use those parts where we feel good about ourselves to heal ourselves about the bad parts. Right? So we have conscious access to our shame and to our good parts, and we're able to process those emotions and work through them. Then as we move to the right towards the trauma state, uh, but still in the I can access my, my shame, is the bad me. This is where shame becomes all-encompassing. I am bad all-encompassing but we understand that we have shame we know we're bad and it becomes really hard to move to the left in this this uh, spectrum here because all of us entire our entirety is bad and it makes it really hard to process that and heal from it and make parts of yourself that feel good and then as we move to the right here, we have not me shame. This is when shame becomes so intense and such a incredible, incredibly bad experience that our minds cannot cope with it at all. And we will dissociate from shame, which means it becomes part of our unconscious, part of our subconscious. We no longer have conscious access to shame which is the left half of this spectrum here everyone on the left half understands they have shame everyone on the right half does not know they even have shame but it is still part of your subconscious it still motivates your actions you just don't know why you are doing those actions because you cannot understand that you have shame This is where I have been for the first 50, 51 years of my life. I am healing and I am moving to the left, but this is where, where I've existed for a long time. And then the last, the fourth type of shame, we're not going to talk about it very much, but it is the know me shame. I do know somebody who I care a great deal about who is in the know me shame. This comes from a very early, early childhood trauma where you are physically in danger. And you are worried about not existing. Like you might be killed, you might be injured. Uh, you don't want to exist and shame comes in and fills up that hole where you, you don't want to exist. Uh, <laughs> it's really hard to describe, which is why we're not going to talk about it. It's also extremely traumatic. If you feel like you know somebody who might be there, have, please have them go see therapist. Um, 
actually, anybody on the spectrum, you can go see a therapist, really. <laughs> but especially <laughs> more towards the right. So. My dissociation came from um, an early childhood experience. When I was two years old, um, my birth father uh, abandoned the family and uh, wanted a divorce from my mother, and my mother freaked out. It was the 70s. She was a teacher. She was doing all the right things. Life was supposed to be giving her all these things. It was going to be wonderful. She had a child, her first child, and now all of a sudden all of that got dumped upside down, and she had a lot of anger and Fortunately, she did not direct the anger at me, but I was a front row witness to all of that anger, and my little two-year-old brain decided that I had to be perfect in order to not have that anger directed at me. And I also dissociated from that shame because it was too intense for me to feel. The only conscious memories I have of shame are actually... Wow, well, i got to go through these slides a lot faster. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm going to skip this antidote in order to get through the rest of these slides. Um, so I dissociated, and because I had to be perfect... Within the next two years, I'm not sure exactly when, I got an ear infection. Has anybody ever had an ear infection? They're, they're really painful, right? Yeah, so when you get an ear infection, you complain. But I had to be perfect, so I didn't. And I lost my hearing in my left ear. I am totally deaf in my left ear because of trauma associated with shame. I just figured that out in July. <laughs> so here's all these different ways that shame can manifest yourselves. And you can see a perfectionism, I have that. Uh, isolation. <laughs> Let's go back to this 2009 picture. Um, this was my first DrupalCon, and this was also literally the last day that I lived in the United States because while I was rooming with Greg Dunlap, I had these two enormous, giant, international travel-sized suitcases with me taking up so much space in our room, and I flew directly from the conference to, to, to Taiwan. And part of that was because of isolation. I was isolating myself from my entire support network, from all my family, from all my friends, from my community in Drupal, everybody. So I, I hope that you can see that shame is very complex and there's lots of parts to it. And now how do we heal from it? Well. <laughs> just knowing all this stuff, you cannot intellectualize your way to healing. It doesn't matter how much you know about something, you're not going to feel better just by knowing about it. I've been on a healing journey for 10 years. I didn't know I was on a healing journey until three years ago. <laughs> and I didn't know I even had eternalized shame until June of this year. Um, so you can absolutely heal without understanding it. But we're, we're web developers. We, we, we use CMSs. We like understanding stuff. So I'm going to explain some stuff. One thing that's really useful to heal from shame is to understand that it is actually a protective emotion. When we have trauma, our body, our mind wants us to survive. It will do anything to protect us. Shame is a protective emotion. 
How does it protect us? It can downregulate our nervous system. So if we are in hypo, hyper arousal, fight or flight, it can move us into hypo arousal. This is submission. If it's dangerous for us to be overexcited, fighting or flighting, it shame will move us into submissive state, which can make us safer if there's somebody who is very threatening near us or a situation that is threatening. Same with tempering our strong emotions. If somebody is, if another person is uncomfortable with our heightened emotions, shame will subdue those emotions. And shame narratives help us make sense of our situation and they actually give us a little bit of hope. I think that's what's going on in imposter syndrome. We feel like if we just do a whole bunch, maybe no one will discover. That's giving us a little bit of hope that we can do something to get through this. That's how shame is helping to protect you. But shame is healed with connections. It is healed with connections to our body, connections to our emotions, and connections to other people. This is the way that we heal from imposter syndrome, from all the different kinds of symptoms that shame will do. It is reconnecting with these things. And specifically, in order to reconnect with our bodies, we can use mindfulness and meditation in order to connect to our bodies. Connecting to our emotions, we can use emotional intelligence, improving our emotional intelligence. And then connecting to other people, we can have community and a support network. So let's talk about connecting to our bodies. Meditation leads to mindfulness. This is, I have been doing meditation for about four years. Um, and it was because I was uh, really bad at procrastination. And I got this little app that was trying to do, like redo your habits and in order to have consistent habits. And one of the habits that they suggested was mindfulness and I was like, okay, if you say so. So I started meditating just because it said to do them. Um, and I have done them consistently for four years. And I always had this idea that I use Headspace app and you open it up and it talks about how you should be focusing on your body, right? For 10 minutes, right? Focusing on your body. And I felt like I was really bad at this. I constantly got distracted. I would be thinking about all sorts of things that was not my body. And they're like, oh, right, right. Yeah. they would get to the end about eight minutes in and be like, now you can let your mind wander. I'm like, damn it. I've already been wandering. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing is, is that four years of constantly being bad at meditation I still found that I was getting more mindful and it didn't make sense to me because I had this incorrect idea of what meditation is. Meditation is the practice of moving from distraction to focus. Each time that you go from distraction to focus is like a repetition of do, when you're doing weight training. So if I have a 10 minute session and I get distracted five different times and bring myself back into focus, that was a really good session. That's why doing this meditation made me more mindful. It was because while practicing this over and over again, where I go, I, oh, I'm thinking of something else. I should be focusing in my body. That was a repetition of being more mindful. And I would discover that outside of meditation in my regular day, I would notice that ooh, I'm feeling really overwhelmed. And then I would focus on my body. Like, how am I actually feeling? That's mindfulness. Being able to pull yourself out of your distractions and back into focus. That is the essential part of mindfulness. Connecting to our emotions, emotional intelligence. So people 
people's experience with emotional inten- intelligence are very gendered, right? When you are a person who is socialized as a woman and you're growing up, you are taught you need to be, you know, to take care of other people's emotions, right? You need to watch other people's emotions so that you can, you know, manage their emotions. This is a terrible reason to learn about emotions, but you still do learn about emotions. (laughs) You learn about your own emotions by, you know, examining other people's and trying to manage their emotions. When you're a person who is socialized as a man, you're not taught anything about your own emotions. You're told to have fewer emotions, in fact. This is also very bad for men. <laughs> neither, neither gender gets a really good uh, emotional intelligence education. But emotional intelligence comes from self-awareness, self-management, and empathy. Now, the self-awareness, that is mindfulness, right? Mindfulness will help you improve your emotional intelligence. Because when we understand, when we become mindful of what's happening in our body, the sensations that are happening in our body, emotions and I'm saying this mostly for the men in the room, but emotions are mostly felt in the body. There's only a little part of your emotion that's actually in your mind. So being aware of the sensations in your body, you you start to recognize, oh, I'm feeling an emotion. I didn't even realize that I was feeling because I was distracted by all these other things. Mindfulness will help us focus on our body so that we recognize our own emotions And then we become smarter about it. We gain an emotional intelligence by recognizing these things. And then once we've done that over and over again, we can start to manage our emotions better. Sometimes we'll recognize that, hey, it's not, it doesn't make any sense why I'm feeling this emotion now. Let's relax and maybe not have this emotion right now. It's sort of inappropriate to the actual situation. Even though I'm I'm feeling, it's okay that I'm feeling the emotion, but like, maybe maybe I can manage my emotions a little bit better. And then lastly here, empathy. Empathy for others and ourselves. Our empathy for other people is actually improved a lot when we have empathy for ourselves. Caring for ourselves. Recognizing it's okay to make mistakes to have big emotions and let ourselves feel those big emotions and process them and move through them. All of that empathy for ourselves will help us have better empathy for other people. So even if you think, oh, empathy is what I have for other people, it will get better if you also have empathy for yourself. So you should maybe focus on that too. I mean, you really do need to. Connection to other people, community, and a support system. This is the third thing that I think that helps when we're trying to rebuild connections and move through our shame, is to have a support system. When you're feeling overwhelmed, when you're having big emotions, who do you go to to just talk about it? One hard thing that you may discover when you're trying to rebuild your community and your support system is that your partner may not be supportive. That's going to be really hard to deal with. But I also think that, and I'm going to bring the focus to marriage, that society puts way too much pressure on marriage and have to be everything to the married couple. You may, it's, it's actually okay that your 
spouse isn't part of your support system, they don't have to be everything. As long as you get yourself a support system, it doesn't have to be your spouse and it's okay. And you can, you should talk about your spouse, with your spouse about that. You can have your best friends become your support system. You can have a therapist be your support system. You need one, it doesn't have to be your partner. But beyond just like, ah, I'm feeling bad, having a community for just smaller things like, I don't feel like making dinner. <laughs> your friend brings, you, somebody in your community brings you food or like you go together with somebody in your community to eat together. Like those things have a really big positive effect on your well-being and on your healing in general. So even beyond just, I'm feeling bad and I need a support system. Community is a huge way to improve your connection and your healing. I think I'm making it through these slides in time. <laughs> I'm going to go through this one last tip, which is the hardest type of shame to heal, which is shame about shame. One of my best friends, her mom had a mental illness and she was really ashamed that how her mom would behave when she was in her mental ill states. And when she grew up, she recognized that she shouldn't have been ashamed about that. This was her mom. She should love them. She should. And mental illness is okay. Like, it's okay for people to have those. <laughs> I have complex PTSD. It's okay to have mental illness. And my friend had shame then about the fact that she felt shame about her mom. And this cyclical shame about shame is a really, really tough knot to untangle. All these other things that I talked about, they, they may not be sufficient in order to untangle shame about shame. But we can do something about that. One is that we should, we should first note our shame. Now, this is one of the meditation practices is noting. Right? So you recognize that I have shame. Maybe you recognize both bits. Like I'm having shame about shame. Right? And label that shame, like what spe how specifically am I feeling shamed? Why am I feeling shame about you know my mother having a mental illness? And then recognize and remember that shame is a protection. How did that shame protect me? Because it did. It is a protective emotion. And that means that it was trying to protect us, make us survive, and we should be grateful for ourselves for feeling that shame. This is the way you untie the shame about shame knot because you don't need to be ashamed about feeling shame. It is a protection. You were trying to protect yourself in the situation. You can't yell at yourself for feeling shame. You will not heal. You have to love yourself for feeling shame. And that is how, <laughs> that is how you become grateful and you lose the shame about shame. You're still going to be left with shame, regular shame, but that's, we've already talked about the ways you heal from that. And then be, be curious about why this need for this protection. Right? Noting, labeling it, being grateful, being curious. That is how we untie that shame about shame. And I would like to say that I am very grateful for all of you being here today. Thank you. Um, I still have questions uh, and I know that you have them too. So 
Anybody have questions that they want to express? Yeah? Uh, it's maybe a personal question, but you said you've been recovering for 10 years and you just knew about it for three years. Can you talk about that time when it started and then, and then when you sort of picked it up? <laughs> So the question was um, wanting me to talk about my experience of you know being on a healing journey for 10 years but not knowing I'm on one until three years and then not even knowing that I had shame until this year. Right? How does that work? Like how am I healing without knowing what's going on? Right? Um, my healing journey began because I was just trying to understand other people. Um, the uh, It was the yes all yes all women uh twitter hashtag because there was a bunch of people like not all men right but then in in, in response to that people started talking about all yeah people on twitter were talking about horrible things that men would do right and then somebody would jump and say not all men and then say yeah but every single woman has an experience where a man is awful to them so maybe not all men, but every single woman has experienced the bad thing from the small group of men who were doing this. And I became curious about women's experiences because I, I was never able to see this stuff because there's this weird thing about misogynist men where if they see another man around, they won't be, they won't be shitty to the women there because they will assume that I'm in charge of the women that are near me, and they will, they're, the misogynists will respect me <laughs> by not being shitty to the women. So I never even saw all of this stuff. So I became curious about women's experiences and feminism, um, and I started researching all this stuff. And I noticed that media that was guided towards uh, women was constantly rated poorly compared to just other kinds of media. Um, and I started reading romance novels. Um, and that was a huge eye opener for me because, you know, I, I grew up as a man and I was not taught how to understand my emotions. And the, here are these books that talk about what you're feeling in your body and then what the lab, literally labeling those as emotions. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> um, so I started to have improved emotional intelligence uh, from reading romance novels. Um, and then, uh, with my improved intel emotional intelligence, I then figured out that I am queer and I came out, uh, last year. Uh, I had been, if I had had the words to describe it back in the nineties, I've basically been queer questioning since like 1991. I constantly was asking myself, Hey, am I queer? And like, like don't think I am, but I, it was an unsatisfying answer, even though I kept thinking I was straight. And I just kept asking the question over and over and again. It was because I had dissociated from my queerness. Um, <laughs> and so I was starting to heal myself just from on trying to understand other people. And I had to improve my emotional intelligence, and I started to understand myself better. Right? And then that has just been continuing. And then when I talked about how my friend has was shame about shame, when I talked to her about that, I was like, that's weird. How come I don't have any shame? I was a queer kid in the 80s. That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> um, and then I just started processing that with a therapist um, and figured out that, yeah, it turns out I do have shame. Um, so yeah, that was that's my experience with shame. Other questions? What you're doing takes some courage, and I appreciate that. Um, I, I'm interested in your meditation practice. What is it? What, tell me a little more about it. So um, I, I I just picked the Headspace app. There are a couple of different apps that are available for doing meditation. Um, I have recently got that tip about how meditation is that practice of being distracted and then moving to um, moving to focus just, just like maybe two months ago um, and I am looking forward to taking the, the second tip from that same source which was you should try to meditate for like 20 minutes like try to get to 20 minute meditations 
and that apparently is very transformative. I haven't yet been able to implement that yet, um, but that's that's where I am, right? I'm still learning about meditation. Headspace is a really good um, app, but it never taught me this thing about meditation, which I was completely missing. So that's the only thing. So now that you've been here, you won't have that problem. <laughs> but I, I practice it regularly. Not every single day, but maybe half the days in the week. Yeah. Other questions? I'll be around if you have other questions you don't want to talk about, you know, on a recording. <laughs> so, thank you.